uh, case studies for the uh, afternoon. Uh, the next um, three presentations will all be uh, different um, examinations of actual uh, user experience with some of the standards and things like that. And um, kicking it off is going to be uh, Pete Brightwell, who um, is talking about uh, on-premise cloud. And they've been doing a lot of studying about this. You know, how does it work? Um, what advantages does it bring and things like that? So um, uh, we're looking forward to uh, a unique presentation here, Pete. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Wes. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm at uh, BBC R&D where we are doing, uh, let's say, case studies of what it means to provide an on-premise cloud. So just... I'm not sure this is the most up-to-date version. Okay, sorry. Uh, I'll, I'll make I'll make do. I'm sure it, it'll be fine. Um, we had a survey at uh, EBU's Network Technology Seminar about what is important to broadcasters. And uh, okay, it's not totally scientific, but uh, with our little tag cloud, we we found that automation that was one of the big big things that would matter in terms of making broadcasters' lives easier and as we move forward. So, and you'll see cloud there as well, and there was agile. So, at this point I would be showing a picture of BBC iPlayer. Uh, BBC makes a huge amount of use of cloud-based cloud -based, uh, processing to produce the iPlayer web on-demand web content. That is happens via Amazon Web Services, so it's really happening via a public cloud. Now, that's quite a, a relatively small amount of content that tra travels at this time. Once we start doing things within the studio, within the studio itself, though, it's a bit more, there's a lot, much, much more content involved. So the... The amounts of content that you need to work with are going to be much, much more. And we feel that the cost models that will be involved for sending it everything over the, over the internet to a public cloud, storing it there, sending it backwards and forwards, that's really becomes unsustainable. Uh, and it's also economic, uh, environmentally unsustainable as well, M moving things. Basically, most of, the, most of the work is happening in one place. Why send it to and, to and from a, a remote cloud? In addition, there's a plenty of uh, special cases, let's say, for on-premise that, that, that where on-premise cloud will help us. So we, for, for instance, latency is a big issue. Uh, the time involved in sending something to AWS and back again, that's maybe un unacceptable for some types of production. The, like I said, the huge amount of content locally, the large bandwidths, and also, there's, there are items of equipment that uh, may not be typical. So they may need to be, for instance, they may have a, a specific bit of hardware that's involved with them. So it's an, a slightly unusual situation. Now, we're doing work uh, on at BBC R&D on what it means to provide a cloud-based production environment. So this is, this is our CloudFit production project. Uh, you can see, if you go to that URL there, you'll see there's, uh, some of my colleagues have been uh, doing a lot of work building up sets of media services to, to make this work. It's a very parallel approach that allows us to make use of multiple parallelized interactions with lots of microservices. So this allows us to adopt a distributed approach that is highly available and is can be built into, up into a, a number of different workflows on an API-based approach. The, the various parts of this, they all have, uh, they all have names of, uh, of uh, animals. So 
at the heart of this is the idea of storing content in a media store, which is we call Squirrel. You squirrel things away. Uh, and this allows us to, to basically store... Uh, you, you may have heard of the term grain, um, which we've been using at BBC R&D for some time now. It's the, the idea of being a, a sort of unit of media, which could, could, could correspond to a frame or it could, could correspond to a little uh, portion of, of audio. So these, these, are, these are objects that have identity and timing associated with them. And the squirrel store will store away all these grains. Uh, we provide parallel write and read access to that. And this uses the, uh, the S3 API, although it was developed by Amazon. It's basically adopted. It's become the de facto standard for how you access cloud-based storage. So that's something we've, we've, uh, we've built, built upon. I'll talk about more about that later. In terms of getting content into the store, uh, this is uh, Magpie. Magpies like to go and get get things from uh, shiny things. So Magpie uh, will go and get a file, uh, break it up into chunks, and then send the grains from each of those chunks. And this is all parallelized into into Squirrel. So y so you get the idea that you know we're b building things in in a number of sort of compositable uh, components. Uh, I'm not quite sure why otter is called otter, but the uh, otter is a, uh, I think it's because ot otters are nice and uh, sort of sleek and sort of swim along the stream. So, so otter is the streaming output service, which will take the, uh, take the grains or the chunks, chunks of grains from the, the squirrel media store, put them into, into a stream and uh, dispatch those out onto, onto the network. Now, we've initially done this with uh, FFmpeg, but we are working on a 2110-based dispatcher as well. So more about that later. So th those are the services we're building. Uh, obviously, we are, we're doing that in a way where we can deploy it in diff on different platforms. We've done a lot of work with Amazon, uh, but we're also doing work with our on-prem clouds. Let's start talking about that. Uh, we are built building a prototype cloud uh, this is at BBC R&D on two, two different sites. We have a site in Manchester, we have a site in well, Salford near Manchester, and a site in uh, West London. Why are, we, why are we building a cloud, you may ask, when uh, people will provide them for you? Well, it allows us to uh, look at different architectures, different ways of deploying. Uh, it lets us understand uh, what we need to know. Part of the reason of doing this work is to, is to avoid lock-in to of any particular cloud framework. So it's important that we don't, or, or I've, I've mentioned, you know, we spend a lot of money with Amazon at the moment, and that's fine. Um, but you know, as, as we scale things up, are we going to carry on doing that? Are we, we need to look at the options, really. So one of the things we, part of this work is involved in looking at the open source options. Have, so by going down the open source route, we have the possibility of um, maybe go out to a wider market for actually uh, provisioning these clouds. Another, another reason we want to do it ourselves is we need to understand what it means to automate uh, things in an IP environment. So part of the part of the reason we're doing all this work with IP is that things can be more automatable and uh, repeatable. So the uh, build we're doing can be sort of wiped and rebuilt in in minutes. And the final reason for this doing this is to be able to understand how to build these clouds based on what is best best practice from data center technology. So what, what do we need to learn in this industry? So the approach we're taking is uh, it's based on how, how big data center clouds are built. So it's a, a leaf and spine architecture. Uh, we, and uh, then we use uh, a number of techniques for ensuring scalability to ensure that we can isolate different users of the cloud, we that we can containerize applications. Uh, 
in terms of the technical details, we use, uh, uh, I've called it multi-chassis lag there, or, or it's uh, also known as a VPC in Cisco terminology. And uh, there's a VXLAN-based uh, network overlay. That, so that basically we're overlaying a layer two network on, on a layer three infrastructure to allow scalability. And of course, we're building this using sort of just off the shelf, off the shelf IT hardware. So a little bit more detail about what that means. Uh, at the heart of this, we're using the OpenStack environment. This is this was uh, created by NASA in, and Rackspace uh, about a decade ago. It's now sort of become the de facto way that people will do on on-prem cloud work. So it. It's now used a lot in the telco industry. If you if you if you're doing a 5G connection, it's probably going to use, it's probably going to have some open stack in there. It's not a one-stop solution. It's basically a, a, a building, a, it's a toolkit really of parts that can be put together. Um, we we use many of the parts that are in that, but not but not all of them. So, for instance, we don't use the the uh, the storage solution. We don't use the object storage solution that is provided. We use a, we use a, we use another one called Ceph. And in fact, this is this. So these are the parts we use. Uh, I won't go through them all, but some of the more interesting ones we've got the, uh, the you know, at the heart of building a cloud. You've got virtual machines. So that's provided by OpenStack Nova. Uh, you've got virtualized. You've got a virtualized network, which is provided by Neutron. A set of orchestration. Technologies called Heat Magnum. Uh, Magnum is interesting because it lets us. It will, it will then let us uh, deploy. Just out of interest, how many people here have heard of Kubernetes? So some people. Kubernetes is becoming a very common way of deploying containerized software. So we we use the uh, OpenStack Magnum project to do that. Uh, then we also use Ceph, which is uh, now the, the the most commonly adopted distributed storage uh, technology that's open source, and that uh, allows us uh, provides a very flexible way of using storage, uh, very high performance. We you can use it for block storage, for and for and for object storage, and that's made available for an S3 gateway. In terms of what it looks like, uh, lots of lots of servers really uh, like this. There are a number of logical networks within that. So you will see on here you've got like a storage. You've got a storage network in green. You've got the management network in in blue. There's so the application networks are separated using uh, VXLAN tunnels. Now VXLAN, uh, you you may not be familiar with it. It's a bit like uh, it's like VLAN on I guess, like VLAN on steroids, really. So it provides you a way of uh, having more VLANs and having VLANs, us using layer three technology to extend layer two. The, we're using a, a, a spine leaf architecture uh, based on that sort of thing. I think uh, you've probably seen that before. And in terms of automation, uh, yeah, a lot of this has to be set up and, and torn down quite quickly. It's important. Yeah, we're going to be using this a lot in our our day-to-day -day work. So we use Ansible uh, to do this. Ansible is a a very common way of automating configuration and setup. So I won't go through all these here, but you can see we we do this to configure the servers. We do it to configure the switches. Uh, we also configure the OpenStack itself, and and BBC R and D. My colleague John Rosser has been quite a, is is on the OpenStack uh, Ansible project. That is, he he's one of the uh, project admins for that. So we're doing a lot. We're putting a lot of work in here on how we how we can automate the uh, setup of OpenStack using Ansible Ansible uh, playbooks, as they call. Basically, Ansible is a a set of uh, sort of nice, simple text-based text approach that makes it very easy to configure things in a, a, in a flexible and uh, reusable and scalable way. 
in terms of what it physically looks like, uh, we're on two sites now. Uh, the first one was the first ones were in Salford uh, at our North Lab, and we've uh, in the last month we started installing kit in London. So th there will be a, this will eventually be a larger a larger deployment, and this is all really just sort of on on prem. Uh, this is this is standard um, standard. Uh, IT hardware, fairly generic, storage, fairly generic, compute, switches. So what have we actually done with this? So we've done some, uh, I haven't talked about 2110, have I? Or, or indeed NMOS. So we've done, we started with some experiments to see how fast we can get content in and out of this cloud. So uh, you can go, if you want to see more about this, there's a lot more information on BBC R&D's blog site at that address there. Uh, you'll see about the results of some work we did, or some experiments we did, getting content through a, a gateway. Now, uh, IP Studio here, this is, this is a project that we've been working on for some time now. It actually predates, predates all the work of the IP Showcase. Uh, and some of, some of the work we've done has fed into, into 2110, has fed into NMOS, and so on. What, we've, what we do is uh, send uncompressed video through our gateway software and hardware and, then, and that is then streamed in, into Squirrel, the Squirrel Object Store. And what we found is we can actually, by suitable optimization of the network stack in the gateway card using, using a technique called kernel bypass, which uh, allows uh, yeah, a, lot of, a lot of the uh, layers within the computer to be uh, um, bypassed then we can, we can easily get 1080i video in and out uh, of, a, of, of a, a local on-prem cloud with um, uh, fairly small latency. And we're storing this in a Ceph cluster. We have, uh, I think it was 30, something like 32 members of this cluster. So you, you, if you remember back when we were, we were writing multiple segment, segments simultaneously. So that is, that is really one of the keys to making this this work well. That is the uh, dashboard, so you can see the uh, yeah, the storage is about a third a third busy in this case. So uh, this is where we are at the moment. We have the twenty one ten environment with a, with uh, this gateway based on a, a sort of Ceph gateway into into a cloud. Where where we would like to go though is or and where we are investigating now is what about sending the 2110 straight into your cloud? So what that means is you need to then start thinking about virtualizing, virtualizing the 2110 senders and receivers. So we've done, uh, I haven't got too many details here, but we have done, we have done some initial investigations on this. Uh, the first investigations have been done using fairly generic, um, fairly generic approaches. So unfortunately, because this is not the, Dated one. The word generic needs to be on this slide. Uh, in so the word uh, generic needs to be before there. Where the, so if you imagine the word generic is there, is it is it actually on? It's on here, is it? Oh, okay. Because there are some other changes as well. Should be data yesterday. Yeah. yeah, that's the one. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, great. No, no. Is it running? Yep. Lovely. Uh, yeah, I so yeah, uh, just jumping back fifteen minutes, uh, iPlayer, BBC <laughs> sorry about this. The, the, the story worked a lot better with this slide here. So B, uh, BBC iPlayer, uh, I guess a lot of you will be familiar, with, is our video on demand, uh, a web-based video on demand uh, system. So we make 10,000 hours available, 
and uh, that makes heavy use of Amazon Web Services, as I said earlier in this presentation. But what that does mean is that most of our cloud work has concentrated on, on transcoding and distribution. So I now jump through all these ones you've seen already. So using so doing some experiments in in uh, at our, our South Lab, we've uh, observed various challenges with just getting content with getting um, sort of twenty one ten streams in and out of the virtualized environments in real time. So part of these are down to the uh, the available compute for performance and so the uh, need to basically make sure that it is, it is fully available all the time. Um, part of part of it is down to the timing. So, 2110-21 has fairly um, stringent, even its stringent timing uh, implications, even in the, its its wider one. So, if you if you just use the the NIC in a in a in a um, I, I guess an off the shelf way, then you find it hard to meet those constraints. Now this does depend in part how you the virtual machine um, talks to the uh, the physical NIC on on the, on the card. So there are different ways of doing it. Uh, if you c the, the most effective way is to to use a directly attached NIC, so the the VM is talking directly to it. But then that lacks the flexibility because it's then sort of hardwired to the NIC. Uh, you can use a bridging approach, uh, but we have found issues with the with the uh, VXLAN scalability solution uh, there. Um, there's also technology called a single root um, input output, and uh, that basically is a, a about um, joining the PCI infrastructure of the in within the card, uh, you know, prioritizing how the uh, the I/O onto the onto the cards work themselves. So again, that we found differences between different NICs on how that works. So the end effect of this is, is it, it's sort of non-trivial to make 2110 um, video work in and out of virtualized platforms, which we know we want to do. So there are techniques uh, that will improve this. Uh, obviously, some of those are mentioned already, use SRIOV. Uh, there's, you, you can bypass the kernel. There are a number of approaches to do this. Uh, NetMap is one that we've actually talked about in the past here, I think. Uh, there's another one, DP DPKD, which is a built, is probably a more modern one we've used on there. Uh, there's also quite a lot of uh, functionality that you can move on to the, the NIC itself. Uh, so to help with packet pacing, to meet 2110, requirements, to, uh, to do the kernel bypass even more on, in hardware, to, to aggregate packets together and to handle the, the VXLAN overlay. So what you're seeing now is, um, if, you, if those of you who are familiar with Blue Peter, so we'll, um, I've basically uh, white, I've, I've whited out the uh, the, the uh, manufacturer's name, but I, if you I, I can ask me later if you want to know who that was. So but there aren't many Nick manufacturers on the on the mar market, uh, and what you're seeing now is that some of them are providing. I guess software libraries to allow some of this off off loading of functionality onto NIC itself, and this is something we we'd like to see more of, to be honest. So obviously, just relying on a particular manufacturer's um, implementation that's fine, but it does mean you're you are restricted in t t terms of the choice of your vendors. And there's some other challenges involved as well with this. So we, as well as the sort of getting the, the uh, packets on off the, the network, you've also got questions of generally the way we work in live IP 2110 PTP environment. That's not typical of what happens within a, in a uh, in a in an on-prem cloud or, or with a, in, in a data center. So. Generally, some of these things I've listed here, the, uh, the use of IGMP multicast, the use of uh, PTP within the cloud, the, uh, the resilience patterns of 
that's 22-7, uh, uh, the latency requirements, the sort of having to tie particular bits of kit to particular machines. Some of these, you know, some of these will be used I in clouds. What generally, uh, but, but we want all of these things. So that's in some ways a little bit of a corner case for all of all of this. So uh, I, I'm just going back to that. So we are, there's you know, further work that we are sort of doing, looking at what it means in practice to to uh, to do this, and having and having a cloud at our disposal will make it uh, uh, a lot easier than trying to, to work uh, with asking Amazon or, or Microsoft or Google to, to do this for us. So um, got a couple of minutes left. Enmos, um, Enmos, you know, it, it's mostly been used. Uh, in an inter-device way within a, within a particular facility, it is quite flexible. In, it, it is quite flexible, and so you could say, how do we want to, how do we work with NMOS in a wider environment? One way, one way of treating it is that the uh, the gateway that I mentioned that at the moment that that is exposed as an NMOS uh, node, so it will advertise itself with the registry that is in there. Another way of looking at this, which we uh, would like to explore, is whether we can bring uh, NMOS more, actually run some of the, the, uh, the NMOS services within the cloud itself. So look, we'll be looking at what's possible there. And we're already seeing that some vendors are starting to provide NMOS functionality on network switches themselves. In any case, uh, how, that, how, how this sort of w fits into the wider orchestration that we need to do with clouds is going to be important. Um, there's, there's an interesting question here about whether once you move to a service-based approach, is the NMOS uh, approach still what you need? Maybe, maybe not. So, yes, so just to final off, finalize this, uh, so at the moment we're now building up the cloud. Eventually it will be uh, six racks big. We're looking at the vendor, the switch vendor, and the, and the NIC vendor, uh, what they have to offer here, trying these out, you know, using our cloud as a uh, test bed for this, and integrating that into our OpenStack work. Uh, we're going to be adding 2110 output to the stream packaging service. That's the one called Otter. And um, considering the other questions I've just talked about, we're also working with the EBU in identifying uh, and you know, writing down likely requirements for automation and orchestration in broadcast facilities. So that's going to help sort of shape our work more in the future. That's it uh, for me. In, any, uh, any questions? Well, thank you, Pete. Um, yes, so do we have any questions? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so very exciting project, I, I believe. So uh, you said uh, you have a, a VxRun scalability issue. So how many VxRun tunnel do you want to create? So how many uh, VX around tunnels? Uh, we don't have a particular number that we want to create. So, so with V with a VLAN, you're limited to um, I think it's something like four thousand four thousand VLANs in a in a single sub subnet. Um, VXLAN lets you have thousands and you know well millions, I guess. Uh, one one of the reasons we're doing this work is that. We're actually providing a facility for BBC R and D, uh, so which so each so each project may potentially create many many individual VLANs. So we that is that is part of the reason for the scalability issue. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, thanks a lot, okay, Pete. Thank you. All right, we appreciate it.